and are we um, impressing that or, or um, help? What's the word I'm looking for? Influence, having, yeah, help, or um, having that influence our interpretation of Scripture, um, and and that's not what we want to do. So we, you know, we want the Word of God to be our our authority, and we want it to be. Um, what we follow in life, how we live our life. So, any questions before we get started? All right. Well, Brian has a a, a background in teaching biblical history, believe it or not, at a public school. Um, he did that for thirteen years, and then he he taught. Is that right? Or seven years? Thirteen years, and then he taught. Um, and you know, um, he's he's taught apologetics and and defending your faith for several years too. So, and he is uh, from Answers in Genesis up at the, uh, the Ark Encounter, the Creation Museum, that ministry up in Northern Kentucky. So if you'd give Brian Osborne a round of applause. Hey, thanks for stalling and giving me a break. That was great. Oh, there you go. You guys doing all right? All right. Hey, it's good to be here with you for multiple reasons. I am from Answers in Genesis. We'll come back to that here in a moment. Uh, I just thought I'd show you this just to kick things off. Uh, I live in Northern Kentucky now. I was born in North Carolina. I lived in Tennessee for quite a while now in Northern Kentucky. We have something in Northern Kentucky that might be shocking to you. We have something called snow. All right, I know. It's amazing, right? And I thought I'd show you a couple quick videos of us, me and my family, sledding a few months ago for a couple reasons. Number one, just so you see my family. So. That's my son, Ian, who is seven. You'll see my wife in a second. And my wife coming up on the side here. We've been married 23 years in June, by the way. And you'll see my daughter, Macy, as well. Just for a second. I might have a picture in here otherwise. This is camera. There's, there's my daughter. There's my wife. And we're going to slide down the hill. It's going to be pretty fun. Pretty go. awesome. Sliding on our stomachs like Superman. That's a lot of fun, I'm not going to lie, all right? So I showed you, showed you that one first before I show you the next one. It doesn't always go that smoothly, so here's another video. Uh, wait, buddy. Hey. hey, guys, here we go. Uh -oh. Here we go. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we hit that fence. Yeah, we hit it. Everybody was okay. I thought you'd appreciate that, all right? Snow is fun and dangerous. Be careful. Uh, but yeah, that's my family. I'm very blessed to be here. But our ministry as a ministry, we are about apologetics. And by the way, apologetics is not apologizing for your faith. It is defending your faith. It comes from the Greek word apologia, which means to give a reason, an answer for the hope that you have. Defending the faith. Why? Not to win arguments per se but to defend biblical authority to proclaim the gospel effectively. That's the point behind apologetics. It really is. It's not about arguing or debating per se, but defending to proclaim to see God glorified through the proclamation of his truth, of his gospel. That's the point of all of this. It's the point of all that we do as a ministry, including the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. As we just mentioned a second ago, these things are incredible attractions. If you get a chance to go someday, I highly encourage you to go. Uh, one of the running themes through our ministry in pretty much every department is that we seek to do things to God's glory. We give it everything we've got. We do our best. We present our best to the Lord because God deserves our best. And so the attractions, they are world class. They are so well done. The quality is exquisite. It's incredible. Walks you through biblical history, answering skeptical questions. There are zip lines, all sorts of great stuff. Ark Encounter, life-size replica of Noah's Ark will blow your mind from the outside. The inside, in my opinion, is even more impressive. You go through three levels. We're answering many questions, showing the Bible is true about all things. And it's so well done. There's zoos, we got kangaroos, lemurs, etc. Zip lines are super fun. Lots going on. Virtual reality rides, 4D special effects theater, planetarium, I both attractions. I mean, it's ridiculous what God has done through this ministry. So if you ever get a chance to go, I highly encourage you to check those out. Encourage your parents to go. It's really worth your time and your trip. And your faith will be so encouraged in an amazing way. And we really kind of bank on this verse. And Jude 1, 3, and other ones like it. Be ready to give an answer for the reason for the hope that is in you. This is, notice, a command. Not a suggestion by God, 
If you're a Christian, you're called to defend the faith. You're called to make disciples. We're called and commanded to do these things. So we want to help Christians to do just that. And so this talk is titled Quick Answers to Tough Questions. It's very cleverly entitled after my book called Quick Answers to Tough Questions. See how clever I am there, all right? And guys, in the book, I give you 33, like, very just concise answers. Each answer is less than 500 words on 33 different questions. Uh, who became Mary? What about the eight men? What about the age of the earth? Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in this session, we're going to just cover some of those. And bear in mind, with each one of these questions, I could spend an entire session or multiple sessions on every one of these questions. And sometimes we do in different talks. But this is meant to give you just a quick 30,000 foot view, a quick answer on these particular questions. And we'll organize it like this. We'll start with some foundational questions first, and that'll help us go through the other questions much quicker. We'll deal with some origins questions, some Earth's age questions, stuff like that. We'll talk about evolution for a bit and eight men. We'll talk about Noah's Ark and flood. We'll talk about dinosaurs. We'll wrap up with some foundational questions, and four hours later, we'll be done. That'll be incredible, all right? Just kidding. <laughs> it's sweet, right? We're out of class. No worries. All right. Um, no, it should take roughly an hour to get through all of that. And, uh, and so if you've got questions about any of the stuff we're covering, hold on to those. We can either talk one-on-one after I'm done, or maybe there's a group Q&A at the very end. But we're, I'm going to talk fast. There's a lot to cover. Hang on tight. All right? So start with some foundational questions first. First question is going to be this. It's a good one. Why? Who cares? Why build the ark? Why build the Creation Museum? Why send out speakers like myself? Why do all the books and DVDs? Why does this matter so much? You're so passionate about it that you do all these things. And guys, we suggest that we're so passionate because we've recognized that God's word is under attack in our culture today. We're seeing the collapse of the Christian worldview. It's being utterly decomposed right in front of our eyes. It's amazing to see in a terrible way. And this is happening because there's been an attack on the word of God outside the church, but also inside the church. And the fact that God's word is under attack, it's not new. The Bible's been under attack since Genesis chapter 3, when the devil said to Eve, did God really say? Getting Eve to question God's word, to doubt it, and ultimately reject it. And the method was so effective, he's used that same method ever since. Different forms, the same basic attack. And one of the main ways he's doing this today is through the teaching of things like evolution, eight men, Big Bang, and especially millions of years, using those sort of secular ideas to watch this to get multiple people to question, doubt, and reject God's word. Did God really say? Same basic attack. And please note this. This is so important. The enemy's clever. He's not dumb. He's smart. He's attacking the Bible's history to undermine the Bible's authority, to undermine the gospel rooted in that authority. Because bottom line is this. If you cannot believe the Bible's history, what it clearly says in the beginning, why trust it about salvation? If you can't believe Genesis 1-1, why trust John 3-16? If the Bible's wrong about origins, why trust it about morality, sexuality, salvation? Ultimately, this is an authoritative issue. Can we trust all that God's word says? And that's why this matters so much in short. We do whole talks on that, by the way. But that's a pivotal point. Keep a hold of that. Another key question, another foundational question will be this one. And guys, I cannot overstate how important this is. Why such different views of the past? Why do biblical scientists and secular scientists have such different views about unseen history? I mean, they're drastically different. You know, 14 billion years for the universe, 6,000 for the universe. It's a little bit different, all right, amongst other things. Why so different? Well, to answer the question, I'm going to ask you a question really quickly. Be careful how you answer this. When do fossils exist? Past or present? Very good. They exist in the present. If they did not, we would not have them. Right? they got to exist in the present. And bear in mind, when you find a bone in the present, it does not come with a label on it saying, hey, I'm 65 million years old, made in China, or whatever. All right? The bones don't come like that. And guys, here's my point. This is so important. All scientists have all the same stuff in the present. The same rock layers, the same fossils, the same radioisotopes, the same DNA, the same distant starlight, all observed in the present. But here's the deal. They interpret those things differently in the present and make different guesses about where those things came from, their origin, and thus their age, based on their different starting assumptions about the unseen past from a human perspective. 
based on their different worldviews. And guys, here's the key. It's simple but profound. If you start with the wrong assumptions, you'll most likely get the wrong conclusions, especially about unseen history. I'll give you just one quick story. A little boy in a doctor's office, he was waiting in the waiting room with his mom. He looked across the room and saw a very pregnant lady. So he walked to her like little boys do, and he said, excuse me, miss, but um, why is your belly so big? He was really little. It was okay, okay? And she kind of laughed. She said, well, I'm having a baby. And the boy was confused. And the baby's in your tummy? She said, oh, yeah. He said, was he a good baby? She said, oh, yeah, he's a real good baby. To which the boy responded in horror, well, then why did you eat him? (laughs) Silly, but you get it, right? Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. And hear me, guys, this is why some really brilliant secular scientists can be so wrong about particular things like age of the earth, rock layers, dinosaurs, etc. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Keep that thought in mind. It is so crucial as we go through all of this. So all that being said, we'll dive into some origins, issues. We'll start with a kind of more philosophical question first. I actually answered this just in the last session. Um, question we get all the time. Uh, if God made everything, then where did God come from? I think we all asked that particular question for good reason. But the answer to it is this. He didn't. You say, what do you mean? Well, asking where God came from, it's like asking the question, why is Shaquille O'Neal so small? If you ask that question, it shows you don't know who Shaquille O'Neal is. Former basketball player, 6'1", or 7'1", 7'2", 350, 375 pounds. He's a really big man, all right? And asking where God came from is a similar thing. It shows you don't know who God is. You see, if you go to the Bible, the very first verse in the Bible should blow our minds. In the beginning, God does not try to explain his origin. Why? He does not have one. Why? Because he is eternal. That which is eternal has no beginning and it has no end. It just is. That's logically consistent, by the way, but beyond our comprehension. Why? Because everything we experience has a beginning and an end. You buy a new car, it gets old over time. It's got a beginning and an end. I turn 44 today. My body's wearing out over time. You've got a beginning and an end. That's all we experience. But God is beyond our experience. He's beyond our comprehension. Why? Because he is God. And this should blow our minds. And I just told the previous group, I think so many times from all like the, the Avenger movies and the Marvel superhero movies and DC comics or whatever, we, we like those movies. I think sometimes, though, We incorporate that into our understanding of God, and we view God like Thor. Like he's a better version of us. Like he's awesome, and he's really strong, and does some really cool things, but he's really kind of like us for the most part, but just another level. But guys, that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is other than. He's beyond our comprehension. Now, we we reflect him, but as a being, he is beyond us. He's eternal. He's all-knowing. Think about this. Has it ever occurred to you? nothing's ever occurred to God. Like he knows it all right now. He's all powerful. He makes everything run all the time. He knows everything. He exists everywhere. He's beyond our comprehension. And the fact that we can't fully comprehend God, that should be a relief. Trust me, if you can understand God, he's not God. He should be beyond us, and he is. So there's that one. Moving on, I spent too long there. This is a philosophical question, but a very important one. I think everybody does ask at some point. Why would God make a world full of so much death, suffering, disease, COVID, mask, etc.? The short answer is, he didn't. Start with biblical history. The Bible is clear that God originally made a very good, perfect creation. Originally, there was no death, no suffering, no disease, no COVID, no mask. And God warned Adam, the day you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. And guys, the Bible is clear that it was man's sin that brought death, the enemy, into God's creation. He made it perfect. We wrecked it in our sin. And that sin changed everything. Romans 8, 22, for the whole of creation is groaning in pain because of our sin. Guys, bottom line, sin changed everything. And oh, by the way, since we all descend from Adam, we're all sinners by nature consequently by choice, and that's why we all need saving through the last Adam, Jesus Christ. See that quick connection right back to the gospel. And then moving on, what about the age of the earth? Did a whole talk on this last night on the age of the earth? What about that? Well, we start with the Bible, 
If we trust the eyewitness account of the Creator Himself, then the plain, straightforward reading of the biblical text is that God created everything in six days, roughly 6,000 years ago. And people today, even many Christians, would push back and say, but wait, where do you get that number from? Well, it comes from a birth certificate of sorts in the Bible, in particular those biblical genealogies like in Genesis 5 and 11, those biblical family trees, so-and-so begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so. Those scenes that'll just knock you out when you try to read them at night, right? Just put you to sleep in a heartbeat, right? But in some of those family trees, those genealogies, it gives you the age of the father when he has his kid, and then the kid's age when he has his kid. And it's pretty straightforward math, and we can add it up pretty easily. So doing so, we know from Adam to Abraham is roughly 2,000 years, and then from Abraham to Jesus is roughly 2,000 years, and then from Jesus to today is roughly 2,000 years. Put that all together, the earth is around 6,000 years old. Or put another way, God made everything around 4,000 B.C. Now, we don't think you can be exact and say 4,004 B.C. at 8 o'clock in the morning. All right? We do know that Adam was made in the afternoon because it was just before Eve. But other than that, you can't be dogmatic. Some of y'all got it. All right, it's all right. Thanks for laughing. I appreciate it. All right? But uh, some would say, okay, but wait. That makes sense, but then how do you know that those days in Genesis are regular 24-hour days? That's a good question. It's a fair question, and there's a good answer. In a word, the answer is exegesis, and this is how we are supposed to read the Bible, exegetically. It means to read out of. It basically means you read a text in its context, because context determines meaning. That's a common function of language. And when you do that, it allows the text itself to be the authority, and God's word should always be the authority. So with that being said, from a read the Bible exegetically, what does the word day in Genesis 1, its Hebrew equivalent, which is yom, what does it mean in the context of Genesis chapter 1? Because the word day does have multiple meanings most words do. One example, in this one sentence, Back in my father's day, it took 10 days to drive across America during the day. You get the word day three different times in one sentence. And it means something different each time it's used. And you know it does based on the context. Right? Context determines meaning. So when does the context in the Old Testament in particular always demand that the word day be understood as a literal 24-hour day? Well, guys, anytime we see any one, of these contextual clues just one time in a text. It's always a literal 24-hour day. So anytime you see the word day accompanied by number, like on the first day or during the third day, it always means a literal 24-hour day. Anytime you see evening and morning with or without the word day in a sentence, it's always a 24-hour day. Anytime you see night with day every time, it's a literal 24-hour day based on context. So we know when day means a regular 24-hour day, based on these contextual clues. Now the question is, how is it written in Genesis chapter 1? Is the text and context clear or unclear? Well, remember these really quickly. Now let's look at Genesis chapter 1, days of creation. Verse 5, he called the light day, the darkness he called night, so the evening and the morning were the first day. Is that contextually clear or unclear? If we're being honest, super clear. There, it's literally contextual overkill. For every day of creation, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, God is driving this home. It's kind of like he knew we would struggle with this later on, and he's helping us out ahead of time. These are regular 24-hour days. Plus, there are lots of really good Hebrew words that mean an indefinite period of time that God could have used if that's what he wanted to say. He used none of those. He used the word day based on the context, 24-hour day. And then, when you look at God's own commentary on the days of creation from Genesis 1 and Exodus 20, 11, God said this from the Ten Commandments. For in six days the Lord made heaven, the earth, the sea, and how much? All that is in them in those six days. The text is really clear. And then finally, well not finally, we'll do a little bit more, but this is a big question though. People say, okay, Brian, fine, you proved your point. Who cares? And that's a fair question. It really is. Why can't Christians squeeze, squeeze millions of years into the Bible? And there are lots of reasons you can't do it consistently. Number one, the text and grammatical structure of Genesis does not allow for millions of years. Number two, the evidence, rightly understood, does not allow for millions of years. But guys, most importantly of all, for the sake of time, the Bible's theology, indirectly the gospel, does not allow for millions of years. You say, what do you mean? Follow me on this. 
As we mentioned earlier, the Bible's clear that it was man's sin that brought death, the enemy, into God's perfect creation. But here's the problem. If you try to squeeze millions of years into the Bible, no matter how you try, and full disclosure, I tried for a long time myself, all right? But no matter how you try, you'll put death before sin. And death before sin is theologically impossible for a bunch of reasons. Here are a couple quick, uh, quick ones. First, in Genesis 1, 29 and 30, in the original perfect creation, God told Adam and Eve they were to eat fruit, the animals were to eat plants. Originally, all things were vegetarian, which I know sounds kind of awkward to us because we probably all enjoy eating filet mignon wrapped in bacon, or double bacon cheeseburgers, or bacon in general, right? We probably enjoy that. And so it, may, it sounds weird to us, but it makes really good biblical sense because there was no death in this world until after Adam sinned, which means you can't eat meat until after he sinned. Because when we eat meat, we're eating an animal that has died. Before sin, no death. Everything has to be vegetarian. Not until after the flood that God told Noah, just as it gave you plants to eat, now you can eat everything. As we joke all the time, this is why you can eat a hot dog, because it is everything. Just so you know. All right. Still good and tasty, but it's everything. Kind of gross. All right. And some will say, okay, but why is this a problem? Here's why. Follow me on this. If we reject the Bible's clear teaching that God made a perfect creation, but then man sinned, bringing death into the world, and then there was a global flood that laid down most of the rock layers and fossils we see today, if you reject that, the clear biblical teaching, and you instead embrace the secular idea that the rock layers and fossils were laid down slowly over long periods of time, millions of years, long before man ever existed and thus before sin in those rock layers supposedly laid down before man before sin we find a lot of evidence of animals eating each other but the bible says before man sinned all things were vegetarian we find in the same fossil record things like brain tumors and cancer and arthritis but before man sinned the bible says god looked down on day six and called everything very good Surely he would not call millions of years of death, suffering, bloodshed, disease, cancer, very good. By the way, if this were true, think about it. It makes God the author of death. And in a real sense, we're blaming him instead of our sin for death in this world. We find thorns in the fossil record, supposedly millions of years old, but the Bible's clear thorns, they came after the curse, right? They're a consequence of the curse. They're a symbol of the curse. And that's why Christ wore that crown of thorns. He bore the curse for us. And then most important of all, if you try to squeeze millions of years into the Bible, it doesn't matter how you try. Day, age theory, gap theory, progressive creation, theistic evolution, framework, hypothesis, cosmic temple, etc. They all put death before sin. And watch this, logically, theologically. If there's death before sin, that means death is not the payment or the consequence for sin. Just always been around, part of God's very good creation. And if death is not the payment for sin, well then Jesus' death cannot and does not pay our sin debt. And we just destroyed the foundation for Christ's atoning work on the cross, whether we meant to or not, and at best, at best, made that event in history unnecessary. And guys, can I tell you, this is why we care so much about these issues. Again, not about winning a debate per se about the age of the earth, but defending biblical authority and the gospel rooted in that authority. That's why this matters so much. And some will say, okay, Brian, I get that, that makes sense, but then wait, haven't they scientifically proven millions of years? Short answer, no. Please bear in mind, you cannot scientifically prove millions of years. Why? Because you cannot get this, observe, or repeat millions of years in a laboratory. Age is more of a historical question as opposed to a scientific question. But what is radiometric dating in a nutshell? Well, here's what it is. There are certain elements in our world that are unstable. And they will change to another element over time. So certain types of uranium will change into lead. And we can measure how fast this change occurs in the presence. It's called the rate of decay. And then we can look inside of a rock and we, could, we can measure the ratios of the elements. How much of the element has changed from uranium to lead? So then they do this. They take the amount of changed element, multiply that by the rate of decay, extrapolate backwards to make a guess about the age of the rock. That's how it works from a big picture perspective. But please notice, when did they measure the rate of decay, past or present? Present. When do they measure the ratios of isotopes, past or present? When do they reach their conclusions, past or present? All done in the present through a set of assumptions about unseen history. And again, 
wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. And guys, hear me, secular scientists aren't neutral. Nobody can be. Either God's word is your authority and your launching point, or it's not. And then man's ideas in some way, shape, or form become your ultimate authority. And from the secular perspective, get this, they assume, before they engage the evidence, they assume the Bible's history is not true. They assume there was no supernatural creation, no global flood. They assume God was not involved. They're assuming the Bible's wrong. Definitely not neutral. It's actually the religion of humanism. Materialism, also called atheism. They're assuming you can and must explain all things with only natural processes. Again, utterly anti-biblical. So here's the deal. Even if radiometric dating worked perfectly, it would not prove millions of years because of the faulty secular assumptions that drive their wrong interpretations. But guys, it's the opposite of perfect. Just a few quick examples. Using carbon-14 dating, part of a mammoth dated to be 29,000 years old, another part of the same mammoth dated to be 44,000 years old. That is a slow birth. I feel bad for the mammoth mother, okay? Freshly killed seals were dated over 1,400 or 1,300 years of age with carbon-14 dating. And of course, seals don't live that long. We're looking at other dating methods like potassium argon dating. We could do a whole lecture series on this, by the way. If you want a lot of details on this, go to the website. But potassium argon dating, this one's a good one to test. Why? Because we're we use this to date oftentimes igneous rocks. That is lava flows that have occurred, cooled, and turned into stone. And this is a good one to test because we actually know when in history certain lava flows occurred when they cooled and turned into stone. So we can date these rocks of historical known age with the method to see if the method is somewhat accurate. I'll give you just a few quick examples of how inaccurate it is. Rocks that formed in Sicily back in 1972 were dated between 200 and almost 500,000 years of age. Historical known age of the rocks was roughly 30 when they were dated. Rocks that formed in New Zealand back in 1954 were dated over 3 million years of age. Known age of the rocks when they were dated was roughly 50. Notice, not even in the ballpark. Or over in Hawaii, back in 1959, the rocks were dated between 1 to 15 million years of age. Known age was roughly 40 when they were dated. And I could just go on and on. And the inconsistencies of these results show the inconsistency of their starting assumptions. Wrong worldview, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. And then one last one. This is the last one about the age of the earth. It's a lot to cover, so I kind of squeeze in as much as I could. We'll move on to another topic from this, all right? But then, big question. You'll hear this a lot, if not now, secular circles, college circles, online, wherever. They'll say, this is starlight. Well, this definitely proves that we are billions of years old. And the argument basically goes like this. There are stars or astronomical bodies out in space that are so far away from us that it would take light even moving 186,000 miles per second, it would take light, billion of years, billions of years, to get from that star to the Earth so we could see it. The argument continues. We can indeed see light from that star. That means, they'll say, there must have been billions of years of time to give that light time to travel from the star to the Earth so we could see it. Make sense? That's the general argument. And here's the thing. You might conclude that that observation in the present, proves millions of years. If, if you start with the assumption, you must explain this observation with only natural processes. Let's think biblically. Dear Christian, creation week. Was that a natural event or a miraculous event? Does it get more miraculous, more supernatural than God speaking? And by the power of his word, he creates everything, creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. How can he do that? He's God. He's other than. He's showing us his power. By his mere words, he makes everything instantaneously by his power. You see it numerous times throughout Genesis and the Old Testament, and God said, and it was so, and God said, and it was so. And on day four, he made the sun, the moon, and stars to give their light upon the earth, and it was so. He made them, and the light got from the star to the earth pretty much immediately. And even many Christians, they will push back and say, but wait a minute, Brian, man, that would be a miracle. Yes! That's the biblical point of showing God's miraculous power. And he told us what he did. You see, some will say, okay, but Brian, if you say that, then aren't you appealing to a God of the gaps argument? Like you just don't know, so you're appealing to some deity out there, some power that we can't know, we just don't know. Not what we're doing at all. Here's what we are doing. 
We're appealing to the God of the Bible who told us what he did in his word. The question is, do we believe it? And by the way, think about it. Logically, theologically, biblically, is it any problem at all for an all-knowing, all-powerful God to get light from that star to the earth immediately any way he wants? Is that a problem for him? Oh, he's God, right? And by the way, it could have been utterly supernatural. Maybe God used natural laws or used them in a unique way. There are many good, brilliant scientists who believe God's word, who have different ideas about how God may have done it and got the light here using even natural laws. Dr. Danny Faulkner of Answers in Genesis has a great one called the Dasher Solution, looking at the supernatural intricacies of the idea of what God may have done there. Dr. Russell uh, Humphreys looks at relativistic models and how gravity affects the passage of time and light. And then Dr. Jason Lyle's got a great one as well. They're all plausible. Maybe God used one of those. Maybe it's utterly different. Either way, it's just not a problem for the biblical God. And then just we'll wrap up with this. Here's what's funny about the whole question. Do you know who has the real distant starlight problem and appeals to the God of the gaps? The secularists, the evolutionists, those who believe in the Big Bang have the real distant starlight problem. It's called the horizon problem. Do more research later on if you would like. But in a nutshell, here's what it is. That there's not been enough time even in 14 billion years, get light across the entire universe, which must have happened for numerous reasons in their model. Not been enough time, even 14 billion years. So how do they explain away this problem? Well, they suggest that after the Big Bang, you know, when nothing exploded and produced everything, after that, there began a period of time called inflation, where for some unknown reason, by some unknown mechanism, time, space, and matter, and light, began to expand faster than the speed of light. By a lot. And it did it for a while, this rapid expansion, for some unknown reason by some unknown mechanism. And then it reached a certain point and it stopped the rapid expansion for some unknown reason by some unknown mechanism and began, and began today's normal operational rates for some unknown reason by some unknown mechanism. Notice, they're appealing to the unknown, non-natural, literally supernatural forces to try to save their naturalistic theory. It's inherently inconsistent. And they're appealing to a God of the gaps, just their own version of God, a natural God. Dear Christian, you don't have a distant starlight problem. The secularists actually do. Keep that in mind. But moving on, what about evolution? Don't we see animals evolving? Doesn't that prove evolution? Well, it depends on what you mean by the word evolution. Do we see this? <laughs> you would think maybe in Florida, right? Seems to fit. <laughs> No, we don't see that. Praise God, that would be weird. Now, to be really clear, do animals change? The answer is yes. And the type of change we actually observe confirms what we read in God's word. Where God said in Genesis 1, 10 times, he made animals and plants to reproduce according to their kind. And the word kind, in the most part for, in the Bible, is equal to about that family level of modern day classification. So according to the Bible, God made the dog kind, and dogs make, guess what? Dogs, right? Exactly. Cats make, unfortunately, right? They make cats. Hey, we've watched peppered moths evolve for 150 years. They've evolved into, guess what? Moths. We've watched Darwin's finches evolve for 150 years, and they've evolved into, guess what? Finches. Now, what did Darwin actually observe on the Galapagos Islands? He saw finches with little beaks, medium beaks and large beaks. There are people in this room right now with little beaks, medium beaks, and large beaks. <laughs> Cover your nose, that's funny, right now, all right? Just variation, not evolving. Humans are humans, birds are birds. And this is what we expect from the biblical worldview. Now, what causes changes within the kinds? Two main things, natural selection and mutations. These things are real, these things cause variation in the world, but here's a bigger question. And for the sake of time, can natural selection and mutations lead to what some would call macroevolution, molecules to man evolution, fish to philosopher evolution, rock to rock star evolution? Can they do that? And the short answer is no. Here's why, please grab this point, because they do not add any new, brand new, specified, organized genetic information. They just shuffle or lose existing genetic information. They do not add it, making molecules and evolution genetically impossible from the word go. I'll give you a practical example of how these things work in the real world. Let's say you got two dogs who get off Noah's Ark, 
and they have kids and their kids have kids and their kids have kids and you end up with a typical homeschooling family. Now, I'm homeschooling, it's okay, all right? I can make that joke. Um, population builds up, population spreads out, and different combinations of genes survive better in different environments. And let's say the initial parents for this population have genetic information for S, short hair, and L, long hair. And it is more complicated than this, but the principles do hold true. So these parents can make multiple variations, right? They can pass on both short hair genes and make dogs with really short hair, pass on one of each and make dogs with medium hair, or pass on both long hair genes and create a super hairy dog. And so let's say a segment of this population with those different variations goes up north where it is cold, like in Minnesota. Well, in that cold environment, the dogs with short hair and medium hair, they'll get cold, they'll freeze, and then they will die. <laughs> okay, wait, wait. If that makes you sad, they can move away. They can just move away, but they're not there anymore, okay? Whatever works for you. <laughs> but after a while in that cold environment, notice all you have is dogs with long hair, which on their own only produce dogs with long hair. That's natural selection and most likely mutations in action. And please notice, did you add or lose genetic information? You lost it. You lost the information for short hair. This is a losing, not a gaining. And so through this process, you get tons of variations of dogs. And by the way, even most evolutionists would agree, guess natural selection on its own can't lead to macro evolution. But they will argue, but mutations can give new information that change a dog to turn to a cat, give it enough time. That's what they're really arguing. So what are mutations? They are when genetic information is randomly damaged or changed. They are rare, thank goodness. They're mostly harmful and lethal because they're accidents in your DNA. They're typos in your DNA. They're not good things, they mess things up. They're randomly rearranging your DNA code. As a very real good connection, a good example of this, could you imagine right now, if I could break into my computer and start rearranging the software programming code one number at a time, how would that help the function of my computer? It wouldn't help at all, it'd crash really quickly. That's what mutations do in reality. As this secular, as we know from mutations, what they do in reality, they rearrange or delete. Hear that, this is so important. Mutations rearrange or delete existing information. They do not add it. That is so important to understand. As this secular scientist says, not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information. Indeed, all mutations studied destroy information. None can serve as an example of macro evolution. And guys, all we ever observe in the real world with real science with natural selection and mutations are new combinations of already existing genetic information with less variability than they started with. Well, that's the opposite of what you need for macro evolution. Real science confirms the Bible all the time. Then what about the eight men? We see these eight men in our textbooks or secular school textbooks. You see it in museums, you see it on National Geographic. Haven't they proved evolution with the eight men? Well, again, bear in mind it's ultimately a worldview issue, again, interpreting these uh, fossils in the present, and again, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. With that in mind, there are three fundamental ways secularists wrongly interpret these bones to get an ape man. Here they are. Either they find some ape bones, add some imagination, dress them up like a human, and create an ape man. They find clearly human bones, add imagination, dress them up like a human, and create an ape man. Or find bones of each, wrongly put them together with imagination, and create an ape man. And there are scores of examples of this throughout history of evolution, but that's really just underpinned by this fundamental point by this secular scientist who says, everybody knows fossils are fickle. Bones will sing any song you want to hear. And that is so true, especially for these fossil fragments. Guys, typically we're finding uh, fragments of fossils, usually one bone or less per specimen. So it is wide open to interpretation. A few examples of this, maybe you've heard of Lucy, Australopithecines, afarensis, just means southern ape, all right, found in Africa. Lucy, supposedly, one of the best evidences of a hominid, one of our ancestors from which we evolved over time. Now, for Lucy, they found 25% of her total fossil. Originally, no hand bones, no foot bones, nothing like that. And then later on, they found some of her relatives. By the way, all of the Australopithecines, their bones are very similar to that of a chimp. Chimp-like long arm, chimp-like curved fingers, chimp-like short legs, chimp-like feet with a toe out to the side like chimps have today, chimp-like hips to walk on all four typically, chimp-like chest, chimp-like shoulders, chimp-like everything. 
Yet despite that reality, fossil reality, she's depicted like this all the time, as standing upright with shorter human arms, longer human legs, human-like feet, just like your feet, maybe not that hairy, but you get the idea. If your feet are that hairy, call somebody, all right? I'm just... <laughs> That's a good example of them imposing their worldview on the evidence. And then this one. Look at this. Artipithecus rambidus. They had this mess. That's what they started with. It took them 15 years to sort out that mess. And after 15 years of reimagination and kind of adding stuff to it, they eventually created Artie. And gave her a Discovery Channel special, making her walk upright like a human, gave her whites of the eyes, supposedly a human ancestor, all based on interpretation, wrongly interpreted from their worldview. Or Nebraska Man. I love this one. For Nebraska Man, they had one tooth. That's one tooth from three different angles. One tooth. That's all they had for Nebraska Man. And, I mean, one tooth. It was a tooth, the whole tooth, and nothing but the tooth. Wait. You can't handle the tooth. Okay. I'm good now. Thank you. I'm good. All right. Had to get that out. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, no, but here, from that one tooth, they drew not only Nebraska man, but also his wife back in 1922. By the way, they kept digging in that particular area. They found more bones belonging to this particular tooth. Turns out that tooth belonged to an extinct variation of a pig. That is the first time that a pig made a monkey out of a man. Throwing that out there, all right. And then Piltdown Man. Here's another one, all right, Piltdown Man. So this was used in textbooks for 40 years as proof for evolution. What was Piltdown Man? A deliberate hoax. Someone found a human skull cap and an ape jawbone. They filed down the teeth of the jawbone, stained them all the same color. They presented them as proof for evolution. And the scientific, scientific community bought it hook, line, and sinker for 40 years. Used as proof to indoctrinate multiple generations. Well, evolution must be true. And watch this. If evolution is true, well, the Bible's history is false. And if the Bible's history is false, why trust about anything else? And I want to show you how far people will go to make the evidence fit their preconceived ideas. I mentioned Lucy just a second ago. And guys, Lucy's hips, they were angled in such a way that she would walk on all fours, typically like chimps today. She could waddle on two legs, go back to all fours, like chimps today. But her discoverers did not like that, and it didn't fit their starting assumptions. So I want you to see what a team of scientists did to make the evidence fit their preconceived ideas. And as you watch these clips, please understand, these people, they're brilliant. Only one that's shown in the video, but it's a whole team behind him. They're brilliant. They're not dumb. It just shows the power of your worldview. So important. Here you go. The ape that stood up, it was a revolutionary idea. We needed Owen Lovejoy's expertise again, because the evidence wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, but the shape of her hip didn't. Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's, which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. But Lovejoy noticed something odd about the way the bones had been fossilized. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we had, this part of the pelvis has pressed so hard and so completely into this one that it caused it to be broken into a series of individual pieces which were then fused together in later fossilization. After Lucy died, some of her bones lying in the mud must have been crushed or broken, perhaps by animals browsing at the lakeshore. Uh, this has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they are in an anatomically impossible position. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bones seem to flare out like a chimp's. Okay, quick pause. Notice, the original ape-like perfect fit, well, that was an illusion. Why? It did not fit their worldview. Now watch what they do to make it fit their worldview. But all was not lost. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. 
He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. That's a big hole in the middle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. Is it any surprise? He literally grinded it down to fit his, pre, his ideas, his assumptions. And again, smart guy, not dumb, but just shows the power of your worldview. Hang on to that. That's really important. And then moving on, some will say, okay, but wait, if we don't come from eight men and we all come from Adam and Eve, then how do you explain all these different people groups all around the world with different things like different skin colors and eye shades if we all come from one man and one woman? By the way, tonight, my second talk, if you come back tonight, first talk will be, it's at 6 o'clock, we're doing dinosaurs, a whole session on dinosaurs. Second talk is on one blood, one race, which is so important for so many reasons. I encourage you to come back for that. But this will be a short version of some of the information there. So how do we explain all these different people groups if we come from Adam and Eve? And guys, the Bible is really, really, really clear that every person who has ever lived can trace their family tree back to one man and one woman, Adam and Eve. That means, biblically speaking, how many races are there? One, the human race. Uh, by the way, since we all descend from Adam, that's why we're all sinners in need of saving through the last Adam. That any descendant of Adam who repents and puts their faith in Christ can't be saved. That's why we take the gospel of every tribe, tongue, and nation. All based on this truth. And some say, oh, okay, I get that, but then wait, how do you explain things like different colors of skin if we come from Adam and Eve? We could pick any trait. We'll just pick that one for the sake of time. How do we explain this from a biblical, historical, scientific perspective? Well, first, we've got to word the question right. Are we different colors or are we different shades? Are we really red, yellow, black, and white? Here's my question to you. Guys, I'm confused. Am I white? People get really scared. <laughs> People get really scared. All right. <laughs> Hey, I'll clarify the question. Am I white like the background around my face in this picture? No. If I, that is me, yeah. If I'm this color white, call an ambulance. Right, or a hearse. I might be dead already. All right, I made a, all right. No, I'm a lighter shade of brown. The guy labeled black, he's not black. He's a darker shade of brown. Guys, scientifically speaking, we're all the same color, essentially brown, just different shades. It's mostly based on a pigment called melanin. It's a brown pigment in your skin. If you have more of that pigment, you're a darker shade brown. Less of that pigment, you're a lighter shade brown. We're all the same color, just different shades, which is so cool when you think about it. And some will say, okay, well, that makes sense, but then wait a minute. How come certain people groups today only produce one particular shade? Like darker shades tend to make darker shades and lighter shades lighter shades. Why does that happen? Well, to explain that, we would need an event in human history where the human gene pool got split up into isolated genetic pools in different areas, where in those different pools, in different areas, different traits become dominant and take over the population over time. Do we know an event in human history where the human population got split up into isolated people groups? Tower of Babel. At that particular time, you get all these different languages, people spread out all over the globe. This creates isolated people groups, isolated genetic pools. They're isolated geographically and linguistically. You're going to stick with people who speak your own language. You spread out a far distance away. You stick with that group. This creates isolated genetic pools. Different traits become dominant, take over the population. And guys, this is genetics 101. Like it's really easy to understand scientifically, biblically, biologically. And it would make sense that God put inside of Adam and Eve all the genetic diversity necessary to produce multiple variations even in one generation. People say that would be cool, but is that even possible? Yes, we still see this today. A few examples. Here's a set of biological twins. You heard me correctly, biological twins. The mother Jamaican, the father German. Now someone did ask me one time if those are identical twins. I just let it go, all right? <laughs> I just let it go. Here's another set of biological twins. Look at the beautiful variation in one generation. By the way, notice the parents, a nice middle brown, which is the majority of the world's population shade, a nice middle brown. Here are two sets of twins from the same parents. Look at the variation in one generation in those sets of twins. Speaking of variation, you'll, be, you'll get a kick out of this over in Australia. 
Here's a real picture of Aboriginal people in Australia. That is their real hair. Red, blonde, wavy hair. That is their real hair. There's a lot of genetic diversity out there, especially going back to Adam and Eve. And then some of the most recent research has pointed out this fact. This will blow your mind if you've not heard this before, that the difference between any two people on planet Earth, genetically speaking, is just 0.1% of your DNA. Put another way, every person on planet Earth is 99.9% .9 genetically identical. There is just one race, the human race. And that lack of variation shows we've not been around that long. And real history bears this out. By the way, if people kept track of their family trees, like certain kingling lines, etc., they can typically trace their family tree back to one of Noah's sons. Two quick examples. The Irish trace their family tree back to Noah through his son Japheth. The Miyazo people of China, they trace their family tree back to Noah, which is cool. But then they take it to the next level. They trace their family tree all the way back to dirt. They're as old as dirt. <laughs> Which seems to have a biblical reference because Adam was made from the dirt. Exactly right. And then let's move on very quickly. Man, running out of time fast. What about Noah's Ark and Flood? How did Noah get all those animals onto the Ark? Well, first realized the Ark was a really big boat, over 500 feet long and 85 feet wide and 50 feet tall, over a football field and a half in length. It was a floating warehouse. It's really, really big. This was not Noah's Ark. Banish this picture from your mind, all right? And then the Bible is clear. Noah took two of each kind on the ark. Not two of each species, two of each kind. And again, the word kind equal to about the family level of modern-day classification. So practically speaking, Noah did not take 400 pairs of dogs on the ark. He most likely never saw a chihuahua or a poodle in his life, okay? He was blessed, all right? All right. <laughs> And so how many kinds would Noah need? You guys are some dog lovers. I can tell that right now. All right, but how many kinds would Noah need to account for all the variations, uh, past and present? 1,400 in total is what he would need. And in a worst-case scenario, he needed roughly no more than 7,000 individual animals on that massive ship. And that's in a worse, worst-case scenario. The number is probably closer to 3,000, but we made it really big just to be extra careful. And then someone would say, okay, but then, talking about the flood, I thought it took a long time, like millions of years, to make rock layers. Not at all. Water, dirt, minerals, you make rock layers really quickly. A few recent examples in nature and the right conditions. Here's a ship's bell encased by a rock. Here's a clock in a rock. There's a spark plug in a rock. Those aren't millions of years old. Or Mount St. Helens, erupted back in 1980. And from that really small eruption by historical standards, it produced rock layers, hundreds of them, in hours hours. We just watched it happen. It produced canyons like this one, nicknamed the Mini Grand Canyon because it's 140th the size of the Grand Canyon. And it made that canyon in nine hours. We just watched it happen. Great observable, testable, repeatable evidence. It doesn't take a long time to make those sort of structures. What you need is a catastrophe. And if you want bigger rock layers and bigger canyons, what you need is a bigger catastrophe, like a global flood described in God's Word. Someone say, but wait, what about fossils? Don't they take a long time to form? Actually, no. Actually, the opposite is true. Typically, you've got to bury something deeply and quickly to protect it from oxygen and decomposition to give it a chance to become a fossil. It's typically a very rapid process. A few examples of this rapid process. Here's a petrified ham. A ham that turned to stone in less than 60 years after being buried from a volcanic eruption. Here's a fish. Fossilizing the act of eating another fish. This was instantaneous. This poor guy did not finish his last meal, so I call this fossil the Last Supper. <laughs> Here's the ichthyosaur fossilizing the act of giving birth, which does not take millions of years. Recently, scientists made fossils in a laboratory. With heat, pressure, and water, they made them in 24 hours. The fossils they made look pretty much identical to fossils you find out in nature. And then, you know, if there was a global flood as described in the Bible, we expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And that is exactly what we find. And then very quickly, dinosaurs, we begin to wrap up here. And there's a whole talk tonight on dinosaurs, by the way, a lot more information in that talk. But what about dinosaurs from a biblical perspective? Well, they were made on day six of creation. How do we know that? Well, because they're land animals by definition, and land animals were made on day six. People say, okay, but why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? 
Well, for the same reason, you don't find words like computer, locomotive, Facebook, or Twitter in the Bible, or TikTok, or whatever, all right? It's a new word. The word dinosaur is not invented until 1841. It means terrible lizard. It wasn't used much until the early 1900s. So, of course, we do not expect to find the word dinosaur in older English translations. Guys, the word was not even invented yet. But there is another word in older English translations that appears to, in many cases, describe various known types of dinosaurs. And that word is dragon, translated from the Hebrew word tadnim, repeated numerous times throughout the Old Testament. People say, okay, but then what did dinosaurs eat? Well, originally, like everything else, they were vegetarian and the original perfect creation. They ate fruit just like all other things. But that changed pretty quickly after man's sin, bringing death into the world. The diets for many animals, including some dinosaurs, would have changed pretty quickly, most likely, post-fall of man. Were dinosaurs on the ark? Short answer is yes. God brought pairs of all the land-dwelling, air-breathing animals. That would include dinosaurs. People say, but wait, was the ark big enough? I mean, aren't there hundreds or thousands of variations of dinosaurs? Well, just like there are lots of variations of dogs, but just the one kind dogs, same thing with cats, horses, etc., there's a similar thing with dinosaurs. There are lots of variations of the ceratopsia kind, but just the one kind. Lots of variations of the sauropod kind, but just the one kind. There are at most 80-some dinosaur kinds. So only two of each needed, so not that many needed on the ark. And some would say, okay, not that many needed, but you can't be serious. Which leads to a very common misconception about dinosaurs. The average size of a dinosaur was equal to that of a bison, like the piano over there. Some were as small as chickens. It's true. Now, if those were still around today, we could eat some good old KFD. <laughs> and of course, it would taste like what? Chicken, there you go, exactly right. But as it turns out, we know that all dinosaurs started small. How do we know all? Well, because they hatched from eggs. And the biggest an egg can get is about the size of a football. Because the bigger the egg gets, the thicker the shell's got to be to support its own weight. But the shell can't get too thick because then oxygen can't keep the creature alive. So max size for an egg is slightly bigger than a football. That means all your dinosaurs, T-Rex, Stegosaurus, Seismosaurus, started off about yay big. And it'll make really good sense that God will bring to know a young adult of all the bigger animals, including dinosaurs, and they're included in the number I showed you earlier. They fit with no problem on that massive boat. And some will say, okay, but wait, if many dinosaurs died during the flood roughly 4,500 years ago, then shouldn't there be a lot of forensic, tangible evidence of them living not that long ago? There should be, and there is. Just a few quick examples, guys. We're finding literally all over the globe and pretty much all the rock layers, we're finding soft tissue from dinosaurs still intact in their bones. The tissue is still literally stretchy and pliable. Oftentimes, blood vessels and red blood cells are still intact in this tissue, and it's been authenticated so many times now, it is ridiculous at this point. And the seculars just can't believe it. It doesn't fit their worldview at all. They're trying to explain it away through multiple mechanisms. But... This tissue, whether the Triceratops one here, duckbill dinosaur, the T-Rex one, I can show you many others time permitted, but this tissue should not last more than thousands of years after the creature's death. In a best case scenario, no way millions. Great evidence, these things just aren't that old. And of course, some dinosaurs were on the ark and they got off the ark and they lived with man post-flood. There should be records of that, and indeed there are. But remember, the word dinosaur is a new word. Before 1841, these creatures were called something else. What were they called? The answer is, for the most part, dragons. And these legends are legion. They are all over the globe in pretty much every single culture. And yet some of those legends have been embellished over time, no doubt. But many of them accurately describe various known types of dinosaurs. We'll talk about some of those tonight in more detail if you want to come back for that. And then lastly, people ask, okay, that makes sense, but then wait, the big question, what happened to them? Short answer, they died. Right? But hey, extinction is the rule of thumb in a fallen, sin-cursed world. After the flood, it's a red climate. There's an ice age after the flood. Man hunted them. Lots of things bad, especially for dinosaurs initially post-flood led to their extinction probably pretty quickly post-flood. And then wrapping up just very quickly, I get this question a lot, some foundational questions. All right, Brian, you flew through that. You seem to make it pretty clear that real science confirms the Bible. But if the evidence really is so clear, how come so many smart people today miss such clear evidence? Which is a good question. Um, but bear in mind, number one, many smart people don't. Many people trust the Bible who are brilliant. Uh, also bear in mind, pretty much every major branch of modern-day science was started by Bible-believing Christian. 
most of whom believed in a young earth, by the way. Pretty amazing how that works out. But why do some smart people miss it today? And the answer is actually in Scripture as well. And that is this, because ultimately, please hear me, all this stuff, it's not a head issue. It's a heart issue that becomes a worldview issue as a result. It's not an intellect issue. It's a battle over the heart. What do I mean by heart? Not feelings. Your will. Because, bottom line, every person has one of two options in this life. Option one, God's God, you're not. He's the authority, you are not. His word is the absolute standard, yours is not. You build your thinking from here. Option two, reject God. And then man's ideas in some way, shape, or form become your ultimate authority. In a real sense, you reject God, you become your own authority because you look at all things and you determine what is truth for yourself. You become as your own God. A lie as old as Genesis chapter 3. And there is no neutrality. Either God's your authority or he's not. It's nowhere in between. So it's not a head issue, it is a heart issue that becomes a worldview issue as a result. And your worldview, watch this, it tells you how to interpret what you're looking at to make it fit your preconceived ideas. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. I'll give you one more good example of this. There are canyons on Mars, evidently bigger than the Grand Canyon, which is cool. The question then comes, okay, well how do these canyons form? Because according to secular scientists, it takes millions of years for canyons to form here on the Earth. They said these canyons on Mars formed in just a few weeks. Really? How? Direct quote. A flood of biblical proportions carved an instant Grand Canyon on Mars. Now think about it. They are willing to believe in a flood of biblical proportions on a planet with little or no liquid water, Mars, but they refuse to believe in a flood of biblical proportions on a planet covered by 70% water. How can they be so blind? Because a PhD does not change a person's heart. It's not a head issue, it's ultimately a heart issue. Romans 1 puts it like this, that the unrighteous, they suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. Before you're saved, we suppress that truth. Actually, in the Greek here, it actually gives the idea the truth is bubbling up within you. You have to actively push it down to avoid it. It's kind of like being in a pool, you got the ball in the water, trying to push the ball underneath the water, you got to hold it down to keep it there. Actively suppressing the truth because... In our sin, we don't want it to be true because if there's a creator God, he made us, we're accountable to him, and sinful man doesn't like that idea. So we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And then how do we use this in our Christian lives? A couple of different ways. Number one, dear Christian, if you're a Christian here today, be encouraged. Your faith is tangible, connects to reality. Real science confirms the Bible, and you can defend your faith. It's not that hard. Just trust the Bible. Be encouraged and also be challenged to stand on the word of God. We have so many Christians who are scared to death to stand on God's word, to be the light he's called them to be. Do not be one of those. You want to be a true rebel? Trust God. That's so strange in our culture today. Stand on his word. Give a biblical defense. In love, yes, but also in truth. Proclaim that truth. To see God work through you in a mighty way. Proclaim that gospel news. Stand on the word of God. And guys, we are told to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. You see, his word is the authority, not ours. Every thought captive. How we think about money. How we think about relationships. How we think about sex and sexuality. How we think about origins. How we think about morality and gender. How we think about the future should all be rooted in the very word of God as the ultimate authority. And when you do that, Man, you can defend your faith in a powerful way and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And then I'll just throw in one extra one here for free at the end. We'll wrap up. Another common question we get is this. Well, isn't Christianity just like every other religion? No. Nothing could be further from the truth. Every other religion, in a nutshell, based on man's idea, says this. You can save yourself. Do enough good deeds. Appease yourself or your God or your gods or the force or whatever. Appease whatever you need to appease. Do enough good things and maybe you can earn your salvation if you're good enough. Only the Bible tells us this good yet really bad news. You could never save yourself. Never. Why? Because the true God, what is his standard for salvation? It is, watch this, perfection. You want to go to heaven based on your own merit? You have to be perfect. 
That means your entire life, you cannot violate just one of his laws one time. You tell one lie, you are justly and rightly damned for hell. You disobey your parents one time, you're headed to hell, rightfully so. And we all know we break God's law all the time, every day, in numerous ways. But just one time is enough. And guys, even our good deeds are like filthy rags before God because they're steeped in our pride. We have no hope in and of ourselves. You're going to be perfect. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> you thought that was bad. Check this out. And you know this, I'm sure. But not only do your actions have to be perfect, so actions must be perfect, but also God sees your faults and your motives and says those also must be perfect. Every thought pure, never lustful, never coveting, never hateful, never jealous. Every motive is you want to honor God first, love people second, yourself is always last. Perfection, your entire life, that is God's unyielding, eternal standard. And any honest person would say, but Brian, besides Jesus, the God-man, nobody could do that. That's the point. All have sinned. We all fall short. That's why we all need a Savior. And that's the bad news that starts in Genesis. But that's why the good news is so good. That if we will repent of our sin, that just means to turn away, agree with God, our sin is wrong, we've rebelled against Him, turn from our sin and turn to Him, and confess Jesus as Lord. He's Lord, God, and King. You put your life in His hands, He's King. You follow after Him, His life is yours. Repent, put your faith in Him, you will be saved, and it's only through Christ. Jesus declared, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets the Father but by me. Only through Christ. And that's the message we want to get out ultimately. Apologetics and evangelism are two sides of the same coin. You defend the faith to proclaim the gospel. That's the point of it. And guys, I give you that gospel presentation for two reasons here today. First of all, dear Christian, please notice we went from apologetics to the gospel. We gave answers to get to the answer. I want to give you an example of how to do that. Also, number two, if you're not a believer here today, if Christ is not your Lord and Savior, your God and King, if you've not repented of your sins, can I implore you, today is the day of salvation. Literally, every breath you take, it is God's mercy on your soul. I'm giving you one more chance to turn to Him for salvation because it's only found in Him. Turn while you can. And by the way, every knee bows, every tongue confesses, Jesus is Lord. The question is when. It really is. How do we get equipped to do this? Just really quickly. First, the website, answersingenesis.org. Guys, there are thousands of free articles, hundreds of videos free on the website, really user-friendly. You guys will be well adapted to this, I'm sure. Use the website, read the articles, share those. Articles for kids, articles for teens, articles for PhDs. Whatever your jam, it's going to be there. Check that out. Books like The Lie, Why This Stuff Matters So Much, really good book for laying a foundation for why we need these answers. The answers books would be great for you guys. If you'd like to read, these are phenomenal for you. So get these, encourage your parents to get them or something like that. Each book has around 30 different answers to different questions. It's really well done. So I encourage you to check all that out. Books on individual issues like Age of the Earth or Rock Layers. My book, Quick Answers. I like this book. It's mine. I'm biased, okay? But it gives you very snappy answers. You can read the whole book in just a few hours to 33 different questions. And it'll give you what you need to defend your faith and give you that firm foundation. And you can go to other resources if you want to dive deeper after that. Also, I do a whole other talk. I'm tempted to do that one here today instead of the one I just gave you. But quick answers to social issues. So in this book, I give you keyword biblical answers to issues of life, equality, sexuality, and environment. So how do we as Christians address the issues of abortion, euthanasia, stem cell research, uh, social justice? What about genocide in the Bible? What about slavery in the Bible? What about, is there sexism in the Bible? What about sexuality, homosexuality? What about the transgender movement? What about climate change and the green movement? How do we respond to those sorts of things from a biblical perspective? Short answers, less than 500 words. And can I encourage you? The answers are there, and they're not that hard. They're from God's word. They're not hard. They're not popular. Be ready for that. <laughs> but they're not hard if you trust God's word. So many other stuff to check out. If you got any questions about anything, feel free to ask me when and if you can. I'd love to help in any way I can. Books and all sorts of stuff. Books for kids, books for teens, DVDs, so much out there. There is one thing I want to point out before we wrap up. The YouTube special, check that out. It's a great deal. But also, there's a special special that may not be on my slides. Let's skip past all this. I'll, put, I'll give you that one. Also, 
If you want to find me later on, you can find me on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, Facebook, I'm more active on. Actually, I'm hardly active on Twitter. Twitter's terrible. Facebook, all right? If you find me on Facebook, send me a message there. If you would like to ask me a question later on someday, you can find me on, that, on Facebook. Send me a question that way. And then right outside these doors, we have two special specials for you guys, if you want. No pressure, but they're there. We have these things called pocket guides. They're little books about yay big, and they are on individual topics. Dinosaurs, evolution, Noah's flood, etc. And normally they're six dollars a pop. They're only a dollar. So if you want those for a dollar, you're welcome to those. Actually, you can even just give the person a dollar. Don't worry even about tax. It's fine. All right, but there's a dollar. And there are two DVDs. Check this out. And science confirms the Bible. They're great DVDs for multiple reasons. They're only two dollars. So you can buy as much of those as you like if you want to. Again, no pressure, but they're there. They're outside through the doors. Pocket guides, great resource. DVDs, really helpful. One dollar, two dollar, take advantage of that if you would like. But I'll wrap up again, first Peter three fifteen. Let's stand on God's word. Actually, I'll wrap up with this. I'll give you a quote. I've talked a lot, I'm sorry. One last thing. A quote from Martin Luther, the Reformation leader uh, in the 1500s. And uh, oftentimes, this is actually attributed to Martin Luther, but he did not say this. He said similar things about this one. This one's written by a hymn writer referencing what Luther went through during the Reformation. But I think it's very poignant for the day we live in. The hymn writer says this, If I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking. I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I might be professing Christ. Watch this. Wherever the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all the battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that one point. Let's know where the battle is. Let's stand firm for the glory of God, and he'll use you in an amazing way. I'll close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for the day. Thank you for the patience of those here as I talk a lot and way too fast. But Lord, we thank you for your grace and all this. We thank you for how you can work through us, finite human beings, decorated dust. You do amazing things for your glory. Help each one of us to be convicted, to stand on your word, to have the courage to stand, the love to care for others, and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, your truth, that we may be obedient to you, love you through that obedience, and then watch you work in an amazing way. God, you are awesome. You're beyond our comprehension. We love you. We praise you. We stand in all of you. Would you be glorified through our lives? We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you for those here. Amen. Guys, let's give Brian a round of applause. If you would. It's, um, I, have, I have no idea. That, that's his sixth talk that he's done in, in two days. I have no idea how he's got the energy to do that, but it, it's amazing. And it's, it's definitely um, God empowering him to, to speak through him, and it's awesome to see. So um, I think that um, your buses are here. So I just wanted to, to say thank you guys. You, you, you all have no idea how fortunate you are and how blessed you are to have a school that allows you to come here and learn the truth of, of God's word and, and how to actually apply it um, into your, your, your lives and your experiences. So thank you so much for, for coming today and um, allowing the kids to hear this stuff. And um, if you, I know probably a lot of you didn't bring a lot of cash today uh, so if you want to come back tonight, we'll, we'll open the doors about five o'clock and um, tonight and you guys can shop around. There's there's so many good resources out here. Um, you know, this is not this is not a promotion for this 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 church. This is something this is um, we want people to know the truth. So whoever it is, so bring your, your parents back, bring whoever back. And, and use those resources out there. They're, they're available for you to have to, um, you know, to defend your faith in, in order to share the gospel. So thank you guys for coming, and um, I guess you want to go ahead and just let them go to the buses? All right, head on out. See you guys.